Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. morning and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am your host, Sarah, and it is the day before Thanksgiving. So happy early Thanksgiving. I hope you have wonderful plans with friends or family or something involving pie. Uh, that's my favorite part about Thanksgiving besides the friend and friends and family is the pie. So I'll admit that now. But really, do you know what I like better than pie even? is books and getting to talk to authors of books. I have another author interview for you today. This time I was with an author of fantasy and she's got a series of books and then a fantasy a serial on her website. So we'll be talking about both of those series as we chat. Her name is Roberta Trahan and I am excited as I said to speak to her. Now astute listeners out there might be thinking, Hey, Sarah, last week at the end of the episode, you said you were going to be speaking with author Carmela Dutra, and you would be correct. Thank you, astute listener. It turns out that Carmela got sick this past weekend, this past week, and she lost her voice. So that does not make for a very interesting podcast when the person that you're speaking to lost her voice loses her voice and cannot talk to you so it would just be me and then long periods of silence and that wouldn't be any fun for anyone now would it so we have rescheduled and i am hopeful that she's feeling better carmy feel better and i hope your voice has come back because i'm excited to talk to you about your books but in the meantime i have this interview and it is with roberta trahan author of the dream stewards series as well as the realm wraiths serial and i'm going to read to you just the first the blurb for just the first book again because I don't like to give away anything in the second book of a series for people who haven't read it so here is the description of the well of tears which is the first book in Roberta Trahan's dream steward series more than five centuries after Camelot a new king heralded by prophecy has appeared as one of the last sorceresses of a dying order sworn to protect the new ruler at all costs, Alwyn must answer a summons she thought she might never receive. By oath, bound by oath, Alwyn returns to Fane Grimary, the ancient bastion of magic standing against the rise of evil. Far al for alongside the prophecy of the benevolent king, a darker foretelling envisions the land overrun by a demonic army and cast into ruin. Alwyn has barely set foot in her homeland when she realizes traitors lurk within the stewardry, threatening to destroy it. To thwart the, cor the corruption and preserve her order, Alwyn must draw upon power she never knew she possessed, and prepare to sacrifice everything she holds dear, even herself. If she fails, the prophecy of peace will be banished, and darkness will rule. So that is the description for The Well of Tears, as I said, the first book in Roberta Trahan's Dream Steward series, just to give you an idea. And we'll be talking about that series first up in her books. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my talking and turn to that interview with Roberta Trahan. Hi, Roberta. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here with you and um, an honor to be invited. So I'm excited about our conversation. I'm excited for our conversation, too. So we are going to talk about your books in just a few minutes, but before we do that, I would love um, for my listeners just to maybe get to know you a little bit. So if you could share whatever you're comfortable sharing about yourself. I think um, the most interesting part of my life really is, is that um, I am a writer in the sense that it is a, an aspect of who I am, not just what I do. And I think it took me a long, long time to understand that about myself. People always ask authors, you know, when did you decide to write? And I honestly don't recall there ever being a decision. It just was always something that uh, I had an affinity for. 
uh, all the way back to early elementary school days. So that's kind of, I think most writers are um, are like that. I live in the Pacific Northwest where I was born and raised. I currently make my home in the Seattle area with my husband. Uh, we are recent empty nesters. We have two adult children that have moved on to uh, other places to pursue their dreams, and we're having a lot of fun figuring out what it's like to be a couple again. And my husband has a regular professional nine-to-five job, but he's also a musician, and um, I have been fortunate enough to be able to spend the majority of my days writing and playing in my uh, imaginary world. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a rescue dog named Murphy who we inherited from our daughter who is now our third child, um, but he's much more manageable than the human one, so <laughs> that works out pretty well. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So you write um, in the fantasy genre, and you have uh, two books in the Dream Stewards series. Would you talk a little bit about that series? Well, that was when I first decided to try my hand at fiction. I'll just back up a little bit and say that I, as a young person, I had uh, always planned to be a journalist, and I began writing uh, for the arts community and entertain, entertainment community and poetry and and essays uh, in my early teens, and was published very early on in some national magazines. And so I thought I was going to be, um, you know, the Cameron Crowe story, almost famous. Mm -hmm. uh, that was almost that was almost me. We are contemporaries, and I was, without knowing it at the time, pursuing kind of a parallel path, and um, went to college to study journalism, and uh, spent a lot of work, a lot of time promoting bands as a side job to try to make some extra money while I was working and uh, selling advertising for the school paper and those kinds of things. And uh, so I started off thinking I was going to be a serious journalist and uh, ended up taking a different career path right out of college and uh, went into corporate sales and marketing and all that kind of stuff where, you know, you could make real money and pay your rent. And um, it wasn't until many years later, even after I had been married and had uh, my children, that the opportunity came for me to sort of uh, step back and reassess my professional path. And my husband said to me, well, weren't you always going to write a book? And I said, you mean like fiction? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had this this window of time, about a year, where uh, I got the chance to explore what that would look like. And I realized that even though, though I knew how to write, I didn't know how to write a novel. And um, The Dream Stewards really was inspired at the time by uh, some love, a long, lifelong love I had for history. Mm -hmm. And there was a movie that came out at the time that we had recently watched that was all about... Um, Viking Invaders, and uh, I had just reread the Mary Stewart Merlin trilogy, which was um, a, a great love of mine from my teen years. And so I thought, wow, this is such a fascinating period of time. And and gee, what if what if Merlin was a woman mm -hmm. instead of a guy? And I, I just started playing around with ideas, and I began initially by researching. Scandinavian history uh, in medieval times. And um, as I began to research more and more about Scandinavian history, stories started to do, take shape for me. Um, but I kept wanting to go back and revisit the Celtic uh, history around Arthur because, mm -hmm. you know, who doesn't? Right. And, um, at that time, my uh, one of my brothers had begun trying to research some of our family history and discovered a connection um, to our family history in Cornwall. So he, he had all this fabulous information. And this was at the time when the Internet was in its infancy. And really, truly, there weren't a lot of resources. I really had to rely on the library and um, information that was provided to me by academics at universities around the world. And um, although the information wasn't available online, the people were. 
And that was the very exciting part was that you were we were just learning that we could connect with people all over the world um, through message boards and email in ways that we hadn't been able to before. Yeah. Um, so, so the dream stewards really kind of evolved out of um, just some research I was doing to try to find a story to write, um, and and I will say that that it's largely inspired by my love for Arthurian legend, although it's set around some real life history that actually happened about 500 years after uh, Arthur lived. Okay, and actually, that's one of the things that I really liked about the book was that often fantasy books center on um, kind of younger main characters. Usually they're in their teens and they find themselves put on this this adventure, this quest that, that they, they need to go on. And what I really love is that Alwyn, your, the kind of the main character, is a woman and she's about 40. And you don't often get mm -hmm. that picture in a fantasy book. And, you know, she's a full and complete woman. She's powerful in her own right, but she's also, she's got to work through issues in her marriage and being a mother and doing all this. And so th I really liked that aspect of it. Yeah. I, I, and I, I don't, I, I, it's one of those things that has been the source of um, a lot of people, have, readers, especially and critics have expressed um, their appreciation for that, but it also was one of the big uh, hurdles for really achieving popular appeal with this book. And and that surprised me because at the time I was writing it, I was um, in my late 30s, going into my early 40s, and, and Alwyn was a woman who was modeled on a lot of the struggles that I personally was experiencing as a, as a woman with a calling. Um, and, and other women I knew in my own generation that were really trying to figure out um, how to do this dance and how to do it well and how to achieve all the things you wanted to achieve in life. And, um, and we were running into walls and having a hard time kind of wrapping our, our arms around it all. And I figured there had to be, that this had to be something that every woman was struggling with in the modern age. And, and and it really couldn't have been that different and even probably more difficult in the historical context mm -hmm. um, because women were even uh, far more limited than, than we had ever known in our personal experience. And to my surprise, the vast majority of, of uh, young readers, anyone under the age of 40, really resented the idea of a heroine being um, someone who was senior to them hmm. and that sort of surprised me a little bit and uh, to be honest um, although I, I can see that that younger readers want to attach themselves to a heroine that they could relate to in in the moment mm -hmm. um, it was it uh, so I hope that I succeeded by kind of creating a multi-generational saga that there are characters that are um, appealing and inspiring to readers of all ages. Um, perhaps the, the even bigger surprise that older women didn't want to read about women their own age. They wanted to read about ingenue and uh, young women who were trying to find their way in the world. And, and um, I found that a little surprising. Um, I, I'm not sure what that's about, but I do think that there are some cultural uh, cultural beliefs around, you know, women of a certain age, mm -hmm. and the idea being that once that once you pass childbearing age, somehow you're no longer sexually desirable, and and that you're no longer if, if you've arrived at a certain age, then you're no longer looking for love or adventure or accomplishment. That somehow by the age of forty, you should have already uh, achieved those things, and um, I, I don't. Think at all true and I don't think it ever has been true so um, it was my hope to kind of model that in a new way for women and say hey you know it doesn't matter what age you are we're always you know hopefully we're all in a growth tra trajectory and there's you know you get do-overs you have different stages in life in which you get to reinvent yourself 
and uh that was my hope and and um I you know I still hope that that we'll find readers that will connect on that level and start to embrace the idea that you know women at 40 are you know pretty badass and and they they still got a lot going on and and oh my gosh you know there there were uh certain kinds of readers out there that were really uh, frustrated by the fact that this woman had already had achieved a healthy or somewhat healthy for her long term relationship that worked. Um, there was this there was this entire segment of the audience that really wanted to read about women who um, were struggling to find love, and I'm like, well, you know, even once you find it, it's still a struggle. Yeah. So let's look at that. Yeah. You know, let's be real. Let's be real about about how relationships evolve. And um, I wanted, you know, to have a relationship that, or to sort of illustrate a relationship anyway that that survived the test of time against some pretty serious challenges and um, try to give people the idea that, yeah, you know, it's not all – romance is a is a many-legged, complicated, wart-covered beast, <laughs> yeah, you know, that look – you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful and horrible at the same time, and you don't get one without the other. So um, that's what I hope – you know, all one represents. I think um, th- as the series con- series continues, you know, she continues to age and grow and take on different roles, and younger generations come forward and and um, kind of write their own story against um, against the backdrop that someone else has painted for them. And I think that just models the reality of um, of, you know, the generational shifts in time. And I, and I try to make my stories be as realistic within a fantasy con- construct as they can be. Well, I am going to jump in here because we do have to take our first break of the podcast, but I was actually fascinated by this conversation with Roberta about not the, the reader's not wanting to read about a 40-year-old woman, wanting to read about a younger woman, or wanting to read about this woman finding love rather than being in a long-term stable relationship. I just, I find that fascinating. And we are going to talk a little bit more about that after the break, and then also talk about her serial, The Realm Wraiths. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back with the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Always on the go, but the day just won't be one without your Hollywood fix. Let Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast take care of that. Jordan and Keith is Entertainment Tonight meets Access Hollywood. I'm Jordan. The guy laughing, that's Keith. <laughs> yeah, I'm Keith. An all-inclusive look of pop culture. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Roberta Trahan. I want to jump right back into that interview because I am fascinated by this conversation of how viewers viewed the main character of Alwyn. That's actually something that I really appreciated in addition to Alwyn being 40 and powerful and, you know, figuring things out in her world. That then you also have her children who are more of the age of the typical fantasy hero and heroine and they've got their struggles and we're watching them that you get to see it in the context of the family um with their parents they're kind of everybody trying to figure things out together and i really i appreciated that so i will say thank you to you for that (laughs) well thanks i'm I'm glad i mean that really there really was the hope and the intent was that i think uh we do see uh, especially with young adult fiction, whether it's fantasy or any other genre, you have these um, young people who are possessed of talent and sophistication and um, experience that um, isn't very realistic. Uh, certainly in the real world, certainly in the real world, that's not what it looks like. And I and I think we all want to aspire. But I, I really felt compelled to say. Um, at least figuratively through my own series, that, hey, you know, those qualities, sure, you know, young people are capable of things that oftentimes society doesn't um, uh, doesn't appreciate. But 
all of those skills come with experience in the test of time and through the counsel and wisdom and, and um, kind of endowment uh, of, of, of the previous generations. And I, I really wanted to honor that because I think we do live in a society that's um, becoming more and more uh, div- divided along generational lines. And I think technology has a lot to do with that, you know. Mm-hmm. But but that is, I think it's important to kind of take a look at how, you know, <laughs> there were people that came before you that, that, that had that had struggles that enabled you to have the skills and the tools and the opportunities that you have, and I think we're 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 so sort of fragmented along those generational lines right now that that uh, it's a lesson that bears exploring. Mm-hmm. <laughs> at yeah. least for at least for me, at least for me. Yes. So there's two books in this series currently. Are you planning um, on a third? Are you going back to this world at some point? Well, the, the uh, this is you know kind of the ways of of the publishing world. The the, the series was originally based um, and 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 structured as a three book as a trilogy, um, with the potential to become a long running series based on some of the secondary characters in in the world. Hmm. And um, at the at the uh, at the time, I was only able to sell the first two books in in the series with with an option for the third and that option is still out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I, and there is a third book um, that, that wraps up the current uh, storyline and then sort of leaves, leaves things open for adventures within that, that world. So I'm hopeful. Yes. Um, I'd like very much to see that third book um, come to life and uh, continue to look for ways to make that happen. Yeah, so come on, people. If you're listening, we need to get that third book out in the world. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Buy the first two, and then we might very well get to, get right. to do the third. That's um, right. There's always, you know, there are more and more options for publishing all the time, and so I have I have a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of hope for that and, and a lot of belief that we'll be able to make that happen. I personally would like to continue with this series as long as people are interested in, in following along. It's a it's a very rich world with um, some really fun characters that I personally have fallen in love with. So mm-hmm. if I can, if I am given the opportunity to continue, I will. You you're also writing um, a series called Aftershock, and that is actually a serial on your website. So first, uh, talk a little bit about the story in Aftershock. Actually, Aftershock is a novella that was uh, published by um, uh, was written on contract for a publisher a couple of years ago, and there is a novel link continuation of that short story that I hope to be able to bring out in the next couple of years. Okay. The serial running on my website is called um, The Realm Race. Okay. Um, and oh it, yes, I it, did. It, okay, it, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Yeah. Okay. Oh no, no, that's okay. It was an experiment for me in trying to write a contemporary fantasy and move out of that historical world for a while and um, play around with the world that we know and what it looks like to write magical worlds and beings and constructs alongside the world that I actually live in. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a lot of fun. I thought it would be motivating for me to um, invite readers to work through the story with me. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and sort of give me an opportunity to sort of test the waters because it's it's tough out there. It's tough to find readers who are looking for the kind of stories that you tell. And this was one way to do that in kind of a real-time uh, process. And and it has been really rewarding and also very enlightening, and it's helped to shape the, the characters and the story itself. Um, this whole series, which uh, also is a series of three books, is they're much shorter, much less complex uh, constructs, but they deal with real-world environmental issues, mm-hmm. and um, that's been kind of fun. I have basically created a um, preternatural world that lives in a in a parallel dimension that has the ability to cross over into the real world, and their current 
reason for being is to try to keep the human world from destroying itself so that uh, they don't also take out the very world along with them. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's a bit cheeky and it's um, uh, been a lot of fun to write. Um, but as, as I say, it's a new, it's a new genre for me to work in. And so I'm relying on the readers who love that kind of story to, to help me learn how to do it well. And how has that been in involving the readers um, with and their comments? Because as we all know, the internet can be a very, very snarky place when it comes to people making comments on things. Have Has it generally been positive or have you had your fair share of trolls? <laughs> well, what I've, what I've discovered, I mean, yes, I've had, um, it's, it's been enjoyable and the comments by and large have been um, uh, positive and, um, and sometimes really enlightening. I think where, um, what I've tried really hard to do is to keep myself out of the reader's conversation and let them discuss things amongst themselves there tends to be, um, uh, my feeling is that the more emotionally charged the comments, the more invested the person is in what you've written. And even if you disagree with it or if they didn't take away from it what you intended, um, that's not really the point. We put it, writers put the material out there with an intent, of course, but um, you have no control, at, nor should you attempt to control how someone enters into that, um, what it strikes, whatever chord it strikes in them, whatever uh, concept or character or um, storyline they attach to, um, I try to be all embracing of that and just let the readers have the experience that they need or want to have regardless of what I may have hoped. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of tough to do um, because it, you know we are we are attached, very very attached to the the world and the characters that we create. Absolutely, and it can and it can be tough sometimes when when people take away something different from from what you put out there. But for the most part, I find that people enjoy the uh, adventure aspect of it. They um, they have comments about the characters, and occasionally I'll see something that actually strikes a chord for me. And when that happens, then I know it's something I need to go back and take a look at and re um, reevaluate mm -hmm. whether or not did I did I do what I intended to do there or not. So that's really helpful in terms of the real right time writing experience. When I was writing the second book in the Dream Stories series, um, I was actually writing that book under contract um, while the first book was being produced and released. It wasn't written at the time I sold the contract. So I had this real advantage of um, having the first book go out into the world while I was still shaping the second book. And as, diff as difficult as some of that criticism was, it was actually very helpful um, and, and it was was a guiding force for me in in terms of how I delivered that second story, and I did make a lot of changes based on reader response, and so I kind of assumed that with this serial experience, it'd be kind of the same thing, um, and and it is, it is, it does help me to connect with readers and understand and have a better insight for uh, what they're looking for, what kind of experience they want to have, and. I found it to be a lot of fun, and it does keep me on my toes. I, I definitely have, I definitely have to um, set a schedule that's something I'm not terribly good at, <laughs> and and deliver to expectations that I set up myself. So you know, I got nobody to blame for me or but me for whether or not this uh, this works out the way I intended it to. So it, it, by and large, it's been a great experience. Good. That's yeah. That's that's really encouraging. I mean, uh, it's nice to see kind of a group collaboration where people are actually invested in the process and being helpful in terms of what, what what they would like to see and how they want to be invested continue to be invested in that story I think the other thing I learned from this is that um, you know people really don't have a ton of time to invest in um, reading for fun and um, I think that this was uh, very eye-opening in terms of my understanding of, of pace and uh, you know, when you do serial fiction, 
people are able to to drop in and get their fix and then go back to the demands of their daily life and sometimes sometimes folks don't have they don't believe that they have the time to commit to a full length novel so uh, this is it's interesting because you're starting to see serials uh become more and more popular in certain reader groups for that very reason there's just so much information that they have to digest on a daily basis um that that this seems to serve a purpose for a certain type of of uh book lover sure All right, so let me jump in here with our final break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll be speaking more with Roberta about her serial, The Realm Wraiths. And I will give you a brief description of that before we go back to talking about her experience writing it, especially her experience writing it as a serial with the input of her readers. So stay tuned and we'll be right back with the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. As promised, I do want to read you the brief description of the Realm Wraiths serial, and this is from Roberta's WordPress blog, and the description is as follows. The Empyrean Defense is the fairy realm's best defense against the human race and its self-propelled trajectory toward annihilation. If humans ever succeed in destroying their own dominion, they'll take the fairy world out along with it. But the EDL is not about to let that happen. Cadet Bliss Horfrost is an overachiever with daddy issues and a chip on her shoulder, but she's also the best agent for the job. Any job. Just one mission away from a coveted commission in the EDL's uber-elite Realm Wraith Squadron, Bliss will stop at nothing to get the gig. But when she's given the assignment that will make or break her career, she discovers the price of success just might be her soul. Assigned to track down a once-trusted EDL operative turned eco-terrorist, Bliss is ordered to infiltrate the human realm and hunt down the rogue before she unleashes a weapon that could unmake both worlds. It's a do-or-die mission, and Bliss is more than up to the challenge. There's just one minor hitch. The rogue Bliss is after is also her sister. With only 48 hours to complete the mission and earn her commission, Bliss soon discovers she isn't the only hunter on the trail. The truth behind her sister's defection is far more complicated than she has been led to believe, and Bliss finds herself stranded and almost out of options. Reinforcements are on the way, but it could already be too late. An eons old blind seer and a hot but morally conflicted half human double agent are all she's got until real help arrives. But the conspiracy Bliss has uncovered might be more than even the realm wraiths can handle. So doesn't that just sound exciting? I mean, really, it. I love that description. It just makes me want to jump in and find out what's going on. I mean, the sister, the the half elf, half human, it, the eco terrorism. It's just it's got a lot going on, and I think it's really fun that she's doing it as a serial. But let's get back to that interview and let her talk about it some more. And how many un- installments of the serial do you anticipate there being? My uh, plan is to write the first book in the series completely as a serial, and I do, at this point, there should be 15 or 16 installments by the time it's all said and done. Mm-hmm. I'm releasing it, and my, my episodes are roughly two-chapter segments, 
and uh, I'm about 75% of the way through the story with the last 25% still to be, um, it's not even outlined, it's it's just completely open-ended with a loose idea of, of how the story wraps up but with the intent that that ending will be shaped as I work through the previous segments with the readers. So uh, at this point, we're looking at about 15 episodes and, and we'll see. It kind of depends on what the readers have to say. Cool. Okay. Thank you. You mentioned earlier that there you, you can't really think of a time when you didn't want to write. It just has always been in you. Do you, what is your favorite place to write? Do you have and do you have a schedule that you try to stick to? I know you said you're not great with timelines, but how does how does your writing look for you in terms of how your process? Well, you know that's something that um, that's a learning curve that I'm still on. Frankly, I've been I started writing the Dream Stewards books about ten years before I actually sold them. Mm-hmm. So I've been at this a really long time, and I still haven't found. Uh, <laughs> I still haven't found a way a way to really become a disciplined writer, and I've sort of given up the ghost on that and accepted that maybe that's just not a part of my natural process. And, and um, I can write to contract. I can write to deadline. I know how to do that. Um, but my natural crafting creative process is very messy, and um, I'm constantly trying to impose structure on it and to to varying degrees of success. Uh, mm-hmm. So my ideally, I finally just settled on, um, I make a promise to myself to write every day and that takes a lot of different forms and it looks different on a daily basis, but um, I can usually achieve that. Sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes it's five hours. It just sort of... Uh, it sort of depends on what's going on in the rest of my life. And, and and that's, I think, what's really hard for most creative people is that you have to sort of nurture that aspect of yourself alongside a lot of other daily demands, just like everybody else. And so I constantly struggle with that. But I do try to write every day. I have usually have several several projects in process at the same time. And when I get stuck on one, I sidestep and spend time with another and and that's i guess probably how i deal with with what people call writer's block um i just move over and move around and then come back to the original project the difference being the difference being when you do have a a book sold for publication you do have some pretty strict deadlines to meet and um i feel pretty comfortable with with being able to do that but right now i don't have that pressure so I'm able to kind of play around in a lot of different ponds and and, and a lot of different creative ponds and just sort of indulge myself, I guess. Um, But but I do admit to not being a terribly disciplined writer. My favorite place to write is is apparently my dining room table, and none of us, uh, no one who knows me quite understands why that happens to be the case. I do have a really beautiful office (laughs) that... I, that I decorated with all of the tools of inspiration and exactly the way I wanted it, and I never write in that room. <laughs> it's just kind of ridiculous, but my dining room table seems to be uh, sort of a rounded place for me. That's where your muse <laughs> lives. Apparently, it's also the most distracting of places because it's right in the middle of, you know, all of the traffic areas in my house. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a place that's constantly being interrupted and, and isn't private at all. And yet, uh, that's where I sit with my laptop most days. Okay. Whatever, you know, you got to do whatever works best. Just, what what <laughs> advice would you give to aspiring auth- authors? Excuse me. Well, I guess uh, I personally kind of draw a distinction from my own experience between um, writers and, and authors in that um, if if your goal is to become a published working author, my advice is always to those folks when I have the chance to talk with them to treat it as you would any other professional discipline. If if you decided you were going to be a plumber, um, how would you go about doing that? Um, my guess is, is that you would find out 
uh, where you would go to get the skills that are needed to to work in that capacity. And the same is true for people who who um, really want to look at publication. Is you have to treat it as you would any other um, professional career discipline. Uh, Cl taking classes is certainly important, but also learning everything you can about the industry that you're that you are deciding to work in, and and that goes beyond just the genre that you're writing in. It means understanding how the publishing world works, how the business uh, works, what's required of a person who is seeking publication, and to get the best understanding that you can uh, of that kind of machine, I guess you would call it. That's it's the part everybody resents the most, mm -hmm. understandably, because it has ab it has absolutely nothing to do with the creative part of of writing. Um, but it is necessary <laughs> if you want to be published to to cross that line, I guess, and and move into the commercial aspect of it. And um, learning as much as you can about that while you are developing your story. Um, is the very best thing that you can do for yourself. It's it's a difficult it's a difficult uh, industry with lots of moving parts that are constantly being redesigned. So uh, you, you, it's just like with any other uh, aspect of your life now, especially when it comes to technology, it's constantly evolving. And so every time you think you've learned something, there's there's going to be a seismic change that's going to require you to go back and learn it all over again. And and I think a lot of times people sort of forget about that. They get their book finished and then they say, "Well, now what?" Um, and, and and there you are with this with this piece of work that may may be perfectly suited to the marketplace. And there may be a publisher out there that is looking for that very story right now. Um, but if you haven't um, sort of explored and, and figured out how to enter into that, um, it's it's going to be really tough and very frustrating, I think, after you've invested all this time and energy and effort in, in your crafting your masterpiece. So that's always my best advice. Writing is something that um, requires skills that are infinitely uh, attainable. You can you can learn to write you can learn to write. I think Creative inspiration is a different beast, and, and that's something you kind of either have or you don't. But you can learn how to write a novel and how to write a good one. You just have to be prepared to invest time and money and, and uh, you know, pain and suffering <laughs> <laughs> in order to get those skills. <laughs> hey, you, you got to be honest, and I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, you're not sugarcoating yeah. it, which is good. Uh, in terms of reading, do you have favorite genres or authors that you read? You know, it's kind of funny that that um, I do love fantasy, and uh, I have a number of authors that I'm always eager to see what they have coming out, although I tend to return most often to some of the more classical fantasy authors like Margaret Atwood and Mary Stewart and uh, Octavia Butler. There are new writers out there that are doing amazing, amazing things. But I find that um, when I seek reading material, it tends to be more science fiction than fantasy, which mm. is kind of ironic, I know, because I don't write science fiction at all. And um, I'm not smart enough to write science fiction, <laughs> at least. Sometimes I feel like I'm not smart enough to read science fiction. <laughs> I think it fascinates me. It, you know, I know, right? There's so much going on and, and uh, there's so much discovery happening right now that uh, it's kind of exciting, but it's also a little scary as we think about technology and mm -hmm. and space and, and, and uh, what else might be out there, right? But I, I get really excited by science fiction and I haven't been reading as much fantasy lately as I normally would. But I do always uh, return to some of those more classic authors. I do love Mercedes Lackey and, and her sort of uh, whimsical take on legend and lore, and I am always glad to pick up a, a one of her books. I also like Iona Andrews, which is actually a husband and wife uh, writing team that writes very uh, adventurous urban fantasy in contemporary worlds, and 
those books are always a lot of fun and they're great escapism too. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. My, my to be read list gets longer every time I interview people because I ask this question. Where can people find you on the internet, on social media, et cetera? Well, I'd like to think I'm pretty much everywhere. Um, I can be found on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. I have a WordPress blog that um, is where the serial novel lives for the most part. Um, also, um, just by searching Roberta Trahan, you should be able to find all of those social media links. And I'm always looking for the opportunity to engage with folks on especially on social media it's uh really cool to be able to connect across the globe pretty much in real time with people and and uh kind of find out what excites them as well so okay i'm hopefully very available i also do have a website at robertatrahan.com although um, i tend to be much more active on facebook thank you for that is there anything else that uh, we haven't talked about that you would like to say about writing in general or your books specifically? Well, well, read them, please. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but mostly I, I just really want to encourage people to, and not just with me, with, with any author whose work that they enjoy or appreciate or are curious about, to reach out and engage. I think most authors are looking for that. I know I am. I really want to know what you think of of the books, of the stories, um, tell me about your experience, even even if it's not a happy one, you know, even if you don't have good things to say, I, I want to know that too. I think it's really important, at least for me, to, uh, I want to grow, and each book I write, I hope it's better than the last, and, and uh, the reader experience and opinions uh, really do shape and uh, affect that process, so it is important to reach out, whether it's through social media or by leaving your reviews at Amazon or Goodreads. Um, that kind of stuff does matter, and it does make a difference as long as it's friendly and respectful. Yes, please. <laughs> then I don't mind having a conversation at all. So I guess I would say that. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me. I really enjoyed speaking to you and, and getting to know you a little bit. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Me as well. I also enjoyed our conversation and I'm just so thrilled to have been invited to be a part of it. And thank you so much for spending this time with me. Thank you. So that was my interview with author Roberta Trahan about her series, The Dream Stewards, and her serial, The Realm Wraiths. I had, as I said, a lot of fun talking to Roberta and getting to know her. Fantasy is one of my favorite genres, although pretty much whatever genre I'm reading at the time tends to be my favorite, but I have uh, always loved fantasy. Thank you, Dad. So it was really fun to talk to Roberta about both historical and contemporary fantasy and urban fantasy, because those those are very different genres of fantasy, and yet it's fun that she's writing both. So thank you, Roberta, for taking the time to speak with me, and I really appreciate it. Go out, check out those books, check out her serial. Um, if you are so inclined, leave her some comments about the serial on her, her WordPress blog. She gave you the address for that, and it is also on our blog. If you didn't know that there's a blog that corresponds with our interviews, now you know. It is www.gsmcbookreview.blogspot.com and you can find that and it will give you the information about the books and about um, the author's whereabouts on social media in case you didn't get a chance to write those things down as you were listening to the interviews. So just one more place to go and find out about the authors that we talk about here on the podcast. Again, thank you to Roberta. Thank you to you. Thank you very much for tuning in. As always, I really appreciate you and your love of books that makes you tune in to this podcast. I hope you will join me again next week on Tuesday. I will be interviewing author Maddie Dalrymple about her book, The Sense of Death, which is um, an Anne Kinnear suspense novel. So we get a little bit um, of suspense and thriller next week with Maddie Dalrymple's The Sense of Death. So please join me for that. In the meantime, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. A reminder that you can find our blog at www.gsmcbookreview.blogspot.com. And you can download our podcasts at 
uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, any app that you use for your mobile device, and you can follow and interact with us on social media. We are at Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram, and we would love to hear from you. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope that you are able to spend time with people that you love and that you are able to count your blessings and maybe eat a little pie or whatever your favorite Thanksgiving food is. I am thankful for you. I appreciate all of my listeners and I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and I hope you'll join me again next time. In the meantime, go eat some pie and get yourself lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.